The Roman way of warfare was characterized by purposeful cruelty. The battles in which the Romans participated were accompanied by the deaths of tens of thousands of people. An even larger number were indiscriminately destroyed by the cavalry during the pursuit. Men captured with weapons in their hands were either killed or maimed. Old men, women, and children were killed, captured, or driven into the field. The war-torn area was devastated, towns and villages were devastated, buildings burned, livestock and property of residents looted. Why did the civilized Romans use such barbaric methods of armed struggle during the wars? Using the tactics of terror, the Romans pursued two main goals. Firstly, by destroying the enemy's resources at the root, they deprived him of further opportunities to resist in an organized manner. Secondly, by intimidating their enemies with acts of cruelty, the Romans sought to break or suppress their will to resist. The Greek Polybius, who lived in Rome as a hostage between 168 and 151 BC and described the features of the political structure of Roman society, the organization of military affairs and armament of the Romans, told about this feature that struck his imagination on the pages of his universal history. When Publius Scipio saw that a sufficient number of troops had already entered the city New Carthage, he, according to the custom of the Romans, sent most of the soldiers against the inhabitants of the city and gave orders to kill without mercy anyone he met and refrain from looting until the signal was given. It seems to me that the Romans do this in order to intimidate their enemies. That is why it is often possible to see in the cities taken by the Romans, not only the corpses of people, but also dogs cut in half and severed members of other animals. What impression this tactic of terror made on their opponents, we can learn from the message of the Roman historian Titus Livy. In his presentation of this material, he relied on another original text of Polybius, which has not reached us. This happened in the spring of 199 BC. At the initial stage of the Second Macedonian War, when two detachments of scouts from the Roman and Macedonian armies suddenly collided with each other. They engaged in a battle that lasted for a long time, and then dispersed each in their own direction, losing some of their men. Philip the Macedonian king decided to take care of the burial of the horsemen who died in this battle. The spectacle of the funeral was supposed to awaken the soldiers' fighting fervor and willingness not to spare their lives, but instead filled them with fear and despondency. Until now, they had only seen wounds from spears or arrows, sometimes from pikes, and were used to fighting only with Greeks and Illyrians. Now, having seen corpses mutilated by Spanish swords, hands, severed with one blow along with the shoulder, severed heads, intestines spilled out and much more, no less terrible and disgusting, Philip's soldiers were horrified by what kind of people, what kind of weapons they would have to deal with. Relief from the triumphal monument to Lucius Aemilius Paulus in Delphi, the scene of the Romans beating the defeated Macedonians. Today it is impossible to say whether these wounds were inflicted in the battle itself, which, according to Livy, was of a very stubborn and fierce nature, or whether the corpses of the fallen. Macedonian soldiers were deliberately mutilated by the Romans after the battle in order to inspire terror to the enemy. Be that as it may, the practice of disfiguring the dead bodies of enemies was very characteristic of the Romans. Especially often the trophy of the winners was the head, which, as proof of courage, was presented to the commander. Into 14 BC, this almost led the Romans to defeat. Many Roman soldiers who participated in one of the battles came from former slaves. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, who commanded them, in order to inspire his soldiers before the battle, promised freedom to anyone who brought the enemy's head. What happened next was eloquently described by Livy. For four hours, the battle remained unresolved. The victory of the Romans was most hindered by the promise of freedom for the enemy's head. The brave man who killed the enemy, firstly, lost time by cutting off his head in the confusion and confusion of the battle, and then his right hand was occupied with this head, and he could not fully prove himself. It remained for sluggish cowards to fight. The military tribunes reported to Gracchus, no one attacks the enemy standing on his feet. The soldiers, like executioners, chop down those lying down and chop off their heads, not swords in their hands, but human heads. Gracchus immediately ordered to throw the heads and rush at the enemy. Shocking in its naturalism is the scene from the relief of Trajan's column, a Roman soldier holds a severed head in his teeth, 
while his hands are busy with weapons. The notes on the war in Spain, written by one of the junior officers of Julius Caesar's army, reflects a curious episode that occurred after the victory over Pompey's troops at the Battle of Munda. On March 17, 45 BC, the enemy has found refuge in the city. Our army has begun its siege. Enemy corpses, weapons, shields and darts found on the battlefield are the materials from which the mine was made. The severed heads of the enemies were placed on top, on the one hand, as evidence of victory, and on the other to instill fear in the besiegers. Thus, we surrounded the enemy from all sides with a rampart. Then, following the example of the Gauls, they surrounded the city with a wall of enemy bodies. Because of this we showered the enemy with a hail of arrows and darts. The Romans were no strangers to the practice of scalping their victims. Describing the Battle of Versailles in 101 BC, Paul Orosius mentions that the Romans cut off the tops of the heads with hair from the dead kivers, terrifying the survivors with such an ugly wound. A funerary stele discovered in 2004 in Lancaster. It depicts Incis, the son of Odulus, who served in the Roman cavalry. He is depicted as a triumphant hero. We see the headless body of his opponent under the hooves of his horse. Incis holds the severed head in his right hand. Bounty hunting has wide parallels with the military customs of other eras and peoples. The head is the most important source of identification. The severed and exposed heads of the enemies were used as the most reliable proof of their deaths. The display of the heads or bodies of the most famous opponents, or at least their symbolic images, was an integral element of the Roman triumph ceremony. The severed head, as mentioned above, was also used as proof of a feat glorifying the warrior who performed it. The custom of preserving the heads of slain enemies was especially famous among the Celts. The famous description of this custom was left by the Greek historian and geographer Strabo. Their stupidity is joined by the barbaric exotic custom peculiar to most northern peoples, returning after a battle, hanging the heads of enemies on the necks of horses and, having delivered these trophies home, nailing them with nails for show before entering the house. Posidonius says that he himself had to observe a similar spectacle in many places. Although at first he was disgusted, but then, getting used to it, he calmly endured it. The Gauls kept the heads of noble enemies in cedar oil, showed them to foreigners, and did not agree to give them for ransom even for their weight in gold. Into 16 BC, the Gauls destroyed two Roman legions that were ambushed, together with the consul designatus Lucius Postumius, who commanded them. From his head, as Livy reports, the meat was stripped off, and the skull was turned into gold from it. As from a sacred cup, libations were made on holidays, and the priests and primates of the temple drank. The use of the severed head of an enemy as a trophy is explained by the meaning that the head had in Celtic and other mythologies, where it was the focus of human power. Separating the head from the body and exposing it, from the point of view of modern anthropology, is a performative action in which a claim to power and might is made. The severed heads of enemies are the most important visual symbol of war and victory in Roman monumental art. In this capacity, they are represented among the captured weapons and banners depicted on the reliefs of the Arc de Triomphe from Orange. This monument was erected, most likely, in the reign of Augustus in honor of the victories won in Gaul by Julius Caesar. In even greater numbers, these images are found on the reliefs of the frieze of Trajan's column, which dates back to 113 AD. There are Roman heads displayed on the walls of the Dacian city, the heads of the Dacians themselves on stakes mounted on the ramparts of the Roman camp, as well as the famous scene in which soldiers demonstrate the heads of the Dacians to Trajan and receive awards for them. The data from narrative sources are well complemented by a number of archaeological finds. Back in 1988, 39 skulls were found in the center of the Roman part of London. All of them belong to men aged 26 to 35 years. Many have traces of the healed wounds, indicating that they belong to soldiers. Characteristic traces of decapitation were found on the bones. The people who owned the skulls apparently became victims of execution. After death, the skulls were in the open air for a long time. No traces indicating the impaling of heads on stakes were found. It seems that the severed heads were simply thrown into a pit almost in the very center of the Roman city. Here they were gnawed by the dogs, because traces of fangs were found on one of the skulls. Scientists believe that the heads belonged to barbarians captured during uprisings or border clashes. They were all brought to London and beheaded here.
we can see images of similar scenes on the reliefs of the columns of Trajan and Marcus Aurelius in Rome. The find dates back to the period between 120 and 160 AD. During the excavations of 1987 to 2002 on the territory of the archaeological center in Almoin and the historical part of Valencia, traces were found relating to the Sertorian War in Spain of 79 to 72 BC. According to the reports of Sallust, Florus, and Plutarch, in 75 BC, Gnaeus Pompey defeated the troops of the Sertorian generals Perpenna and Gerenius in the Battle of Furia, and the latter fell on. The battlefield along with 10,000 of his soldiers, Valencia, which was the stronghold of Sertoria in the eastern part of Spain, was stormed and destroyed. In the southeastern part of Almoina, archaeologists have found traces of fire and destruction, which, according to related finds, date back to the first quarter of the I century BC and, accordingly, may be associated with the events described. However, the most interesting finds were the whole and fragmented remains of 14 people belonging to young people aged 19 to 25 years, tall about 175 centimeters, with strong bones and developed muscles. Two of them had specific microtrauma of the spine in the lumbosacral region, which occurred during intensive writing. All the remains contained traces of sophisticated bullying and torture, including sword strikes, decapitation and amputation of arms and legs. The man to whom these remains belonged had both legs and both arms cut off, after which his body was burned in the flames of a bonfire. The nature of the damage suggests that these people did not die in battle, but were brutally tortured and able to resist. Perhaps in this case we are talking about a planned action, when a selected group of prisoners were subjected to a painful execution in order to inspire others with the horror of their fate. Thanks for watching. Put likes and leave a comment. Keep your finger on the pulse. There is still a lot of interesting things ahead.